With 34 new roller coasters looming on the horizon across the United States, there is a veritable buffet of roller coaster treats. That's the most new roller coasters to appear in a single year since the depression in the US. We're in the midst of a full-blown coaster renaissance. Unleash on the world something that we can call the sequel to the beast. This is the son of beast. There was no doubt about it. As the 20th century was coming to an end, the coaster wars were as hot as they've ever been. Six Flags was adding not one, not two, not three, but four new coasters to the former Geauga Lake in upstate Ohio, freshly rebranded as Six Flags Ohio. Six Flags was adding over 20 new coasters chain-wide for the year 2000, echoing what they did in 1999. This included the 255-foot Goliath at Six Flags Magic Mountain, and that would hold the record for the world's tallest drop for a grand total of three months, before Cedar Point opened up the 300-foot Millennium Force. That record would fall three months later, thanks to Steel Dragon 2000 in Japan. Kings Island wasn't aiming for the world's tallest coaster, but they were aiming to destroy all the major wooden coaster records. They did it once before with a beast 20 years prior, and the Beast's progeny, as the Cincinnati Post Connie Yeager put it, was Paramount's King's Island's year 2000 offensive in the high stakes coaster wars. Its father spread pandemonium throughout the Midwest. Its arrival will thrill a nation. Its legacy is destined to change the world. Presenting Son of the Beast, the world's tallest, fastest, only looping wooden roller coaster. Son of Beast, only at Kings Island. The Son of Beast would not only be the world's tallest wooden coaster, standing 218 feet with a 214 foot drop, and not only would it be the world's fastest wooden coaster, topping out at 78 miles per hour, it would be the first wooden coaster to go upside down with a massive 118 foot vertical loop. There was one record that the Son wouldn't take, and that was the record for length, still owned by the father. It wouldn't be that far off though. It would clear 7,000 feet, sprawling over 12 acres of land. Upon its announcement, General Manager Tim Fisher said, Son of Beast will be THE Millennium Coaster. It will stand as a monumental symbol of Paramount's Kings Island's commitment to quality and world-class rides and entertainment. This $20 million coaster would be located near Top Gun, heading out into an undeveloped area of the park, formerly the Wild Animal Habitat. It would be manufactured by the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, a company that built its first coaster at Fiesta, Texas in 1992 with the Rattler, and they had a few projects opening around the world in 1999 and 2000. For such a massive project, track was already vertical by the spring of 1999. By the dawn of the new millennium, Son of Beast had its first problem. In January, a 50 by 100 foot part of the structure fell over, blamed on high winds. Some workers had also complained about the safety conditions on the project, and that got OSHA to come out to investigate. They slapped a $110,000 fine for 18 violations, mainly around the lack of fall protection systems, and the failure to determine if temporary bracing was strong enough to withstand high winds. The park was cooperative in addressing these measures, implementing new site-specific rules due to the complexity of building Son of Beast. When the park opened in mid-April, there was a lot to be excited about. There was a new upcharge attraction, Flight Team. This was a helicopter ride, taking riders up and giving them an aerial tour of the park. And if you paid more, you could get a tour of Cincinnati or Dayton, with a custom tour possible for an additional fee. This would cost between $25 and $155. There were also 10 new shows for kids and adults. Timberwolf has some big acts lined up, like Sugar Ray, Smash Mouth, Chicago, Weird Al Yankovic, Duran Duran, and Martina McBride. There was also a new direct entrance to Waterworks, allowing guests to get in from the parking lot and avoiding the dry park. The one thing they weren't looking forward to was Son of Beast. Construction delays pushed its opening back. Two weeks later, Son of Beast was finally set to open its gates. Two hours into its opening day, maintenance was still trying to get it ready for prime time, with the lines stretching throughout the park. Once they got it working, it got rave reviews. Don Helbig, the record holder for the most rides on the racer with over 11,000 to that point, said Son of Beast exceeded his expectation. There's no lull. It's non-stop action and speed. After that opening Friday, Son of Beast opened for some time on Saturday, but it was shut down for the rest of the weekend. There was a 15-foot section of track at the top of the second hill that needed adjustments. They planned on reopening it the next week, but that didn't happen. The park was hoping to get it open the week after, but that deadline came and went. Finally, almost a month after its opening day, Son of Beast was back open to the public. 7,000 riders lined up to ride it on its reopening day. Other than some minor mishaps in June, Son of Beast remained operational for the rest of the season. 
But by the end of the year, Kings Island filed a lawsuit against three companies involved in building the coaster. One was the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, hired to design and build the ride. Another was Wooden Structures Incorporated, hired as the lead structural engineer. Finally, Universal Forest Products of Hamilton provided the lumber. Kings Island alleged that shoddy design and construction forced the ride's month-long closure. Once the 2000 season got underway, Kings Island launched the month-long Dinosaurs, a prehistoric journey, a kids exhibit featuring 13 dinosaurs and interactive stations. They also had been hosting the kid-friendly Howl of Scream up to that point. But in 2000, they would launch Fear Fest, a much more dark and terrifying event, transforming different areas of the park into sinister destinations. Despite all the action and all the new additions, capping off their $40 million two-year expansion between 1999 and 2000, attendance dropped for the second straight year, down 4% to about 3.2 million. The park blamed this not on Son of Beast, but on bad weather. For the 2001 season, the park would focus on the kids, expanding the Nickelodeon Splat Zone into Nickelodeon Central and adding three new rides. This included a retheme of the King's Mills Log Flume to the Wild Thornberry's River Adventure and Rugrats Runaway Reptar, a Vacoma suspended family coaster. Kenton's Cove Keelboat Canal never got to see the 2001 season, removed for something big the park had planned for the future. Outer Limits Flight of Fear would drop the Outer Limits from its name, as well as dropping its over-the-shoulder restraints, replacing them with much more open lap bars. James Bond, a license to thrill, was retired from the newly renamed Action Theater, replaced by Stan Lee's 7th Portal and Smash Factory, and would start being used to host films during the Halloween season. 2001 was also the first year the park would offer a gold pass, offering a free upgrade for families buying their pass in April. This would give access to some rides an hour before the rest of the public, two for deals on Tuesdays where guests could ride twice without getting back in line, and access to preferred parking. The park brought in more family-friendly entertainment, like the Mapapa Acrobats and Forbidden Magic, Secrets of the Mummy's Tomb, a magic show in the Paramount Theater. Timberwolf was set to feature Jessica Simpson, Aaron Carter, and the Spirit Song Festival, as Kings Island continued to be a popular spot for Christian music acts. Son of Beast had a smoother sophomore season, giving its one millionth ride in June, 2001 was a big rebound year for Kings Island, with attendance back up 4% to 3.36 million, crediting the success of the Gold Pass and the new Nickelodeon Central. The park had conducted surveys to see what people wanted. They wanted more family-oriented attractions. The park listened, and they were rewarded. Kings Island would win Amusement Today's Golden Ticket Award for Best Kids Area in 2001, and they would win it every single year for the next 18 years. Even with a sagging economy and travel fears following the September 11th terrorist attacks, Kings Island, as a regional park, did not suffer as much as the big destinations. Looking to add to their most popular park on their 30th anniversary, Paramount used its hottest brand for a brand new thrill ride, Tomb Raider The Ride, based on the popular Angelina Jolie film. This would be a heavily themed, totally immersive dark ride experience. The show building would be located next to the Beast in the Rivertown area, on the former site of Kenton's Cove Keelboat Canal. The whole experience would start with a queue line, where patrons would enter the cursed tomb and be sealed inside. Everything from this point on would play off scenes from the movie, as park spokesman Jeffrey Siebert said, there is nothing like this in the entire world. The infrastructure of this ride is unparalleled to anything Paramount Parks has done to date. The ride was a Hus giant topspin, flipping riders around in the darkness, equipped with fog and light effects, lifting riders up to stare at sharp, icy stalactites on the ceiling, then dropping the riders and dangle them over a supposed lava pit. This would use fountains to shoot wider near their faces. Tomb Raider would coincide with a $2 hike in the admission price, up to $42 for a single day and the adult gold pass was selling for $84.99. This would not include a ride on the brand new Slingshot, a fun time bungee ride that would launch riders 275 feet in the air at speeds of 100 miles per hour, flipping the whole time. This would open as an upcharge attraction. The 2002 season also started without its oldest steel coaster, King Cobra. Once its manufacturer, Togo, went out of business in America, parts were harder to come by and maintenance became more difficult. It served the park for 18 seasons. 2002 was also the first year for new general manager Craig Ross, replacing Tim Fisher. Ross was Kings Island's vice president of resale in 1995, before moving on to the same role for the entire Paramount Parks chain. He oversaw some big changes following the 2002 season, starting with a retheme of the popular Phantom Theater that served 11 years. This would be called Scooby-Doo and the Haunted Castle, a multi-million dollar overhaul that was billed as the first interactive family ride in the park's history. A four and a half minute ride where guests board mystery machine vehicles, equipped with fright lights, they can shoot at targets along the ride and collect points, adding them up at the end to see who won. SpongeBob SquarePants 3D would start its long run at the Action Theater also, but the biggest addition of 2003 would be Delirium. Kings Island employing Huss a year after installing Tomb Raider to build a giant frisbee, the first of its kind in the world. This would raise riders 137 feet off the ground in a swinging motion like a pendulum, following a 120 degree arc, all while spinning. This would be on the plot of land that King Cobra left open. 
Craig Ross also oversaw the addition of metal detectors, something that had become more and more common after the September 11th terror attacks. And Ross wanted to make it a point going into his first full year. We are constantly evaluating and enhancing our safety and security measures. As a part of this process, and in conjunction with world events, we are implementing this system as one more tool to ensure the safety of both our guests and associates. The process would also include a bag check for the first time. In order not to hinder the guests trying to enter the park, they installed 30 metal detectors, outnumbering the amount of turnstiles. In addition to the new rides, the park also debuted the Tomb Raider stunt show in honor of the 2003 Tomb Raider sequel, The Cradle of Life. Timberwolf also welcomed in Def Leppard, Aaron Carter, Billy Idol, and Third Eye Blind. In late September, a severe storm with over 100 mile per hour winds caused major damage to Warren and Hamilton counties and destroyed the Paramount's Kings Island sign, collapsing in the parking lot. Kings Island stopped offering the helicopter rides after the 2003 season, but they were about to bring a whole new experience for the water park. Waterworks opened in 1989, had a major expansion in 1997, and now it was being retired in favor of a major new water park resort. Craig Ross explained, if you crave innovative water adventures, or if you simply prefer to relax and be pampered all day, the new water park resort will have something for everyone. This would be called Crocodile Dundee's Boomerang Bay, sporting an Australian theme, and featured four new attractions for 2004. This included the Tasmanian Typhoon, the raft slide with a giant funnel at the end of a 269-foot tunnel. The park even got Crocodile Dundee himself, Paul Hogan, to promote the new water park. The problem was, Warren County was expanding rapidly and were having problems with the water supply. Kings Island's request for an extra 500,000 gallons per day was met with skepticism, but they figured it out and got it done, and Crocodile Dundee's Boomerang Bay opened on schedule in late May. Kings Island also launched a new event for teenagers, Extended Play Fridays. From 8 p.m. to midnight in the Action Zone, anyone 16 and older could enter for $5 and dance and party with guest DJs. For kids, they rolled out the Nickelodeon Celebration Parade with 80 performers, six floats, and encouraging guest participation. For everyone, the Paramount Theater got a $1 million renovation and a new show. Paramount's Magic of the Movies Live, including brand new theater seats and a new digital projection system. Park guests would even be chosen to recreate scenes from movies like Titanic and Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> my, my favorite's still the um, King's Island, The Beast. Mm. I presented a paper at an entomology convention in Cincinnati just so I could ride Son of Beast. Head over heels on a wooden track. <sighs> 2004 was a big success, with the park bringing in 3.5 million guests, a 7% increase from 2003. Looking ahead toward a major addition for 2005, the park closed two classic rides. One of them was Flying Eagles, formerly known as Flying Scooters, a Coney Island original. The other was Less Taxis, the antique cars that opened with the park. They also took this opportunity to remove the Ohio Overland Auto Library, standing but not operating for seven years. Kings Island would use this land for their brand new coaster, the well-themed Premier Rides launch coaster, The Italian Job Stunt Track. This was based on the 2003 Mark Wahlberg film, The Italian Job, with the cars resembling BMW Mini Coopers, recreating climactic chase scenes from the movie, equipped with special effects throughout the ride. Kings Island would also have interest outside its gates, closing its campground and announcing its replacement, a joint venture with the Great Wolf Resorts for a $100 million project, a 39-acre family resort and entertainment complex. This would include a massive 404 suite resort, an indoor water park, and a conference center, among other attractions. There would be shuttles and trams taking guests from the lodge to the park and back. This was another step in turning Kings Island into a year-round destination and getting people to stay multiple days at the complex in the summer. This was set to open the following year. Meanwhile, there were rumblings at the top. Viacom was rumored to split into two companies, built around its main TV properties, CBS and MTV. This led to uncertainty about the future ownership of the park, a park that saw 3.3 million visitors in 2005 down 5% from the year prior. This was despite the return of Winterfest, the event that Paramount got rid of right after buying the park in 1992. Bill Balfour, Kings Island's manager of entertainment and special effects said, the original Winterfest opened small and kept growing. Winterfest is gonna be more impressive when it opens than it was when it closed last time. The most popular attraction was the ice skating rink on International Street. So they brought that back and decked out the entire front of the park with brand new decorations and lights. This was joined by parades, shows, special dining and retail options, and the signature attraction was the White Christmas Express, using the railroad for a show experience. This was about a soldier coming home after World War II. One of 2005's casualties was smoking in the park. It would only be permitted in designated zones, but the park also lost Scooby's Ghoster Coaster, replaced by a Zamperla Skater Coaster, Avatar The Last Airbender. This would be one of six new rides for their kids' area, being totally revamped. 
Nickelodeon Central and Hanna-Barbera Land would be renamed Nickelodeon Universe, with the Hanna-Barbera themed rides receiving Nickelodeon themes. This included the family wooden coaster Beastie, now with the name Fairly Odd Coaster, and their smallest coaster, Scooby Zoom, renamed Top Cat's Taxi Jam in 1998, would now be called Little Bill's Giggle Coaster. The world's greatest kids area would become even more spectacular in 2006. Over the summer of 2005, it was clear that Viacom was going to split into two, and by the end of the year, it was done. Paramount Parks fell under the umbrella of CBS, and they immediately decided to put the chain up for sale. Because the theme park industry had matured and stabilized, the days of double-digit increases in revenue were gone. The industry was lucky to see 2 or 3% growth each year. With slow growth and high capital costs, these parks didn't do much to boost stock prices. If CBS was going to invest in theme parks, it would be in the fast-growing Asian market, not America. The news drew immediate interest from several parties in January 2006, including some private equity funds, Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, owner of the Busch Gardens and SeaWorld Parks, and Cedar Fair, who owns six parks nationwide. The sale would put all the parks' branding in jeopardy, including all of the Paramount movies like Top Gun, Tomb Raider, and The Italian Job, but also Nickelodeon, with Nickelodeon Universe taking shape as the sale was being negotiated. On Monday, May 22, 2006, a deal was struck. In a $1.24 billion cash deal, Cedar Fair was the big-time winner of the five Paramount Parks, plus the rights to operate Bonfante Gardens in California. For Paramount Parks, Cedar Fair was a good suitor because of their history of operating major parks, including Ohio Cedar Point and Geauga Lake. Cedar Fair was interested because this would double their portfolio with large-scale, well-established parks, and they would gain a more national presence. The deal was expected to close in the third quarter of 2006, and Cedar Fair assured guests they would not notice any differences in operation for the new season. However, by midsummer, Cedar Fair announced that Winterfest had been tabled and would not happen in 2006. The one year the event came back, attendance was below expected levels. When asked if Winterfest would ever come back, the park's response was, we never say never. Despite the demise of Winterfest, Fearfest would remain. Cedar Fair may have been happy with their investment as a whole, but they were about to inherit one giant problem. It seemed like a typical midsummer Sunday evening. A train full of riders on Son of Beast was dispatched, and about halfway through the ride, they felt a sudden jolt. This was in one of the large helices, the one known as the Rose Bowl. One rider said, It felt like we hit something, or jumped the track. Everyone was screaming before that. Then, it was complete silence the rest of the ride. A witness said he saw people being carried away on stretchers. Others were bleeding from their mouths and hunched over in pain. 27 people were sent to the hospital, most with minor chest and neck injuries, and all but two were released the same day. When that train came back with the injured riders, the next train was stopped on the lift hill and the ride was shut down. The state came in to inspect the ride the day after, and they believed the accident was caused by a crack beam that caused a dip in the track. This led to a lawsuit by the end of the month, filed by one of the riders who fractured her sternum, stayed at the hospital for four days, and couldn't return to work for eight weeks. Son of Beast would remain closed for the rest of the season, as the park and Cedar Fair had to decide what to do. They concluded the structure was not meant to bear the ride's weight, and they could remedy this by using lighter trains. They bought the trains from the recently defunct Hurricane Category 5 from the Myrtle Beach Pavilion, manufactured by Gerstlauer. These were much lighter than the original, and they would cause less stress on the track and the supports. There was just one problem. The lighter trains wouldn't gain enough speed to complete the vertical loop, and the ride signature element had to be removed. The state also said the park had to make other structural changes, including adding metal supports to make the structure more resistant to stress. After giving Son of Beast another chance, Cedar Fair was busy rebranding the park ahead of the 2007 season. All references to Paramount were removed, and the park went back to its original name, Kings Island. The one thing that didn't change right away was the roadside marquee, the one that was just replaced after collapsing in the 2003 windstorm. The park said that would eventually be swapped out. As for new additions, there were five new live shows, including The Endless Summer on Ice, the first ice skating show in 12 years, as well as a roller coaster that was new to the park, but not new to the state of Ohio. Firehawk was a Vacoma Flying Dutchman, located right next to Flight of Fear in the new x space section of the park an area themed to a secret military base. This operated at Geauga Lake from 2001 to 2006, and Cedar Fair decided it would be better off with their new acquisition, and led to a lot of speculation about that park's future. Later that year, Cedar Fair would announce the closure of the Geauga Lake theme park, leaving just the water park behind. Since moving the Bavarian Beetle to the park in its opening year, Firehawk would be the first relocated coaster to come to Kings Island. There was also excitement around, not a new coaster, but a coaster given new life. Son of Beast reopened on the 4th of July, Five days shy of a full year being shut down, operating with trains that were one-third lighter than the original. Craig Ross said, It's still really good. We even had some people clapping and cheering in the station. 
But while Son of Beast was reopened, another ride in the action zone was shut down. This was Drop Zone, closed down ever since a teenager's feet were severed on a similar ride in late June. The ride at Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom was also built by Intamin, so the closure was out of an abundance of caution. It reopened after about a month, once it was determined that the cables that snapped in Kentucky were not a hazard at Kings Island. By the end of the year, Kings Island was ready to roll out the revamped Halloween event called Halloween Haunt, replacing Fear Fest. The biggest new addition was Club Blood, a new venue full of vampires looking to repopulate. There would be nearly 400 live characters, double the number from the year prior, and Halloween Haunt would be more intense, relentless, and gory, according to the park's new spokesman, Don Helbig. The Cincinnati native that was known for riding the racer almost 12,000 times and seemed to be at all the park's major events was now part of the team, and he remains there to this day. When Cedar Fair bought the Paramount Parks, it included a deal to keep the Paramount name in front of the parks, as well as the Paramount branding for 10 years. They chose to rename the parks right away, but didn't change any of the names of the rides during their first full year. Going into the 2008 season, all of that would change. There was a major effort to rename and retheme all the Paramount rides, though they tried to stay close to the general theme but give it a generic name. At Kings Island, two theaters and five rides were renamed. Most notably, Top Gun was renamed Flight Deck, and Tomb Raider was now The Crypt. Don Helbig said, Some guests are going to need time to adjust. They grew up with the park one way, and now it's going into something else. Another big change was that Racer would no longer run one side backwards. This started as a gimmick back in 1982, and it was so popular it stayed around for 26 years. What we're doing is getting back to the feel of the original Kings Island. That's something our older guests will remember and appreciate. Our younger guests, who have only known one thing their whole lives, will find it different. But we're confident they'll come to love it as much as ever. Our theme this year is history, tradition, and nostalgia. We're getting back to being a homegrown park. The park knew that taking away this experience would be a tough sell for its guests who came to love the backwards racer. But that was just one of many challenges the park would face in 2008. The economy was struggling. The price of gas was spiking to nearly $3.50 a gallon. But Kings Island was hoping that as a regional park, they could stay afloat. The park was also hit with a legal defeat, losing their $20 million case against RCCA's insurance company. Kings Island won their lawsuit against RCCA in 2005. But once that company went out of business, the park sought payment from the Admiral Insurance Company. In 2008, a court of appeals ruled the insurance company did not have to pay, citing that commercial general liability policies do not cover claims of negligent manufacture. Kings Island also fought the Mason City Council on a proposed tax on park admissions, even threatening to de-annex from Mason and return to Deerfield Township. They did not want anything to raise their admission price, which in turn hurts attendance. Kings Island didn't welcome anything new in 2008, but they did draw in a lot of people with two acts. After years of denying Robbie Cadeville a chance to outshine his dad's jump from 1975, Kings Island under Cedar Fair was more open to it. More than 40,000 people came to the park on May 24, many of them flocking to the park to see history being made. He landed the 200-foot jump over 24 Coke Zero trucks, hurting his back on the landing, but it was still a success. On the 4th of July, there was another family connection, as Rick Walenda broke his grandfather Carl's tightrope record, the one set at Kings Island back in 1974, covering 2,000 feet in just over 35 minutes. Cedar Fair was just breaking the ice on their new investment over its first two years in charge. By the summer of 2008, it was obvious something big was on the horizon. Kings Island didn't want to give too much away and let the speculation create some buzz. Don Helbig encouraged people to come to the park, take pictures of the construction, and watch this new roller coaster take shape. Every day, our guests ask, what is it? It's just one of those things you can see unfold in front of your eyes. No other details will be revealed. All we will tell people is it's going to be a ride. What kind of ride? People are just going to have to wait and see. Not only would Kings Island's new coaster create a big splash, it would be the start of a new era for the park. Kings Island was already one of the country's premier parks, but Cedar Fair was about to launch the park to new heights never seen before. Thanks for watching episode 4 of this 5 part documentary. If you could drop a like and share this video with anyone who may be interested, I would really appreciate it. This is a massive project and I appreciate the support. Stay tuned next week for the final episode, as Kings Island becomes a darling of the Cedar Fair chain, and the park rises up the ranks to challenge the country's best.